Hello. My name is Stanislas Dehan. I am a French uh, cognitive neuroscientist. I study the brain. And today I would like to tell you about uh, our research on how the brain learns to read and why it is pertinent for education. Um, my uh, laboratory, uh, situated uh, just south of Paris, specializes in uh, viewing the brain through various means. And I think you are aware now that we have a growing panoply of brain imaging methods, which include uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, as well as uh, electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography to track the dynamics of brain activity. Um, you may not be aware that these techniques are now available also to study education and to study the child's brain. It is entirely feasible these days with training with a mock scanner and welcoming of children inside that scanner to have excellent images of the child's brain as it is learning, uh, even to do repeated scannings. And these children are extremely happy uh, to come to the lab and participate in this research. All they need to be told is that they are like astronauts inside this spaceship and that uh, in uh, mo not moving, which is very important for us, uh, they contribute to science, but also contribute to the spaceship not moving. Um, so uh, with this, we can study how education changes the brain. I would like to mention in this slide what I think brain science can bring to education. Uh, I th this is a very simple point. I think it's a shame that teachers know more about the workings of their car than they know about the working of the brain of their children. Um, and uh, I mean it. I think if you want to change the system, you have to understand how it works, what are the rules of operation. And um, I believe that empowering teachers with the appropriate knowledge of the principles of brain plasticity and education will lead to better classroom practices. There is a lot we know already in cognitive neuroscience which is relevant. The competencies of the young child for vision, language, numbers, many others. How learning works, the role of attention, the role of reward, the role of sleep, the importance of sleep for consolidation of learning. The transfer from explicit to implicit knowledge, many other topics are relevant. I also think that cognitive uh, science can help measure uh, progresses in education and experimentation is absolutely essential in order to test education protocols and to quantify their effects on behavior and on the brain. And finally, I believe also that cognitive neurosciences can participate in the development of teaching devices, such as school curricula, manuals, or software. I'll give an example of that at the end. So, today, I want to talk specifically about the topic of reading and what we understand about it from the brain's point of view. If you had not learned to read, any page of text would look to you like this stone, a texture, but no meaning. But because you've learned to read, you can have a conversation with the deceased, you can speak to the dead, you can listen to the dead with your eyes because you can read what they wrote 2,000 years ago. You can communicate thoughts to the mind through the eye, which is the great invention of the world, according to Lincoln. So how does that work? Well, this is a picture of your left hemisphere. The left hemisphere of the brain is most essential for language and reading. And um, just to orient you, this is the back of the brain, this is the front of the brain. It's been slightly inflated, so you can see inside uh, the folds. And now I want to show you the activation of the brain as you read one word. We see it in time. So let me start this. Here we go. And you have the word unfolding from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Uh, it will loop several times. You can see the information enters into the occipital pole, which is the visual side of the brain, moves into the ventral areas and then explodes into the left hemisphere uh, distributed activity. I have no time, of course, to explain to you all of the details of this brain activity, but I want to show you a sort of caricature that you can remember. And this is very simply that reading starts as any other visual stimulation in these generic visual areas of the occipital pole of the brain, but then very quickly moves into an area that we have discovered, which concentrates the recognition of the written word. I have called it the brain's letterbox because it is where we store our knowledge of letters. And from there, what you have seen is this explosion of activity into at least two networks, one that concerns the meaning of the words, and another that concerns the pronunciation and the articulation of the word. And so we can say essentially from the brain's point of view that learning to read consists first in recognizing the letters 
uh, and how they combine into written words, and second, connecting them to these systems coding for speech sounds and for meaning. And what is rather remarkable is that all of the areas in orange and in green here already exist for spoken language. They are shared between spoken language and written language. So uh, not only that, but they already exist in a young child. Um, we can image the brain of young babies, uh, even when they are extremely young, few months of age. We have various methods for that. And when we have them listen to language, we already see this network of regions, which uh, exist also in the adult brain and that process spoken language. So we may say that reading is not creating something completely novel. Reading consists essentially in connecting uh, creating an interface between vision and the language system, the spoken language system. When the child comes to uh, the reading school, it already has a very sophisticated spoken language system. It already has a very sophisticated visual system, but it needs to create this interface, this visual word form area, this brain's letterbox, and to connect it appropriately. And in doing so, it needs also to change some of these target systems. How does this work exactly? We've conducted a large number of studies and many other labs in the world have conducted many studies that look at what has been changed in the brain of children or adults after they've learned to read. And uh, in particular, I want to mention here a study that we did very recently, which was published in the journal Science, where thanks to a large international collaboration, we uh, were able to scan illiterate and literate subjects of various levels of literacy in Brazil as well as in Portugal, bringing them to our lab in France. Um, thanks to this experiment, we managed to make a complete map of the areas that have been changed by learning to read. And as all of you in this room know how to read, you can consider that your brain has been dramatically changed. Um, so I've told you about these areas for language. The first major change that we see in the literate brain is this letterbox area coming active only in people who have learned to read. It will activate in direct proportion to the reading score and it will activate to the letters that you know. It will not activate, for instance, to Chinese if you don't know Chinese. So it has learned the shapes of the letters. It is accompanied by major change in the visual cortex, in your, in your early visual areas, which is generic and serves for all sorts of visual tasks, you have changed the precision of the coding in your visual cortex because you've learned to read. But most importantly, you have also changed your representation of speech sounds. If you've learned an alphabetic language, you have changed the way your cortex codes the phonemes of speech, the elementary uh, components of speech. And learning to read is to a large extent the capacity to attend to the individual phonemes of speech and to attribute them different letters. When we see this map, of course, we could think that the connection between these areas must, must also be changed. And I'm happy to say that with new methods for identifying the connections of the human brain, we can also track these changes. We can see, even in a living person, all of these fiber tracks that connect different brain areas. We can see their microstructure. And what we see is that, indeed, this particular connection uh, bundle which exists in all brains, is reinforced and is being changed in people who have learned to read. And there is a good likelihood that this bundle is involved in connecting the letters to the sounds. Bidirectionally, when you hear a sound, you can also think about these letters. Um, this change is subtle, but it is an anatomical change. So the anatomy of the brain is also changed because uh, children learn to read. We make these essential changes that, of course, create a whole new modality of input of language. Um, there are lots of things we've understood about the details of this process. I want to give you a few. The first thing is, what does this area do before we learn to read? Uh, it's, of course, not an area that has evolved for reading, so it must be doing something else. And what we have found is that this region reacts also to faces and to objects. It is involved in visual recognition in all species, actually, in all primates, at least. And what we find is that as you learn to read, so this is reading score on the x-axis here, what you can see is that the response to strings of letters increases in this area, but the response to other categories decreases. So there is a sort of competition 
in the brain of the reader. And the new function of reading has to find some space in the cortex, making room, as it were. And what we find also is that the representation of faces is therefore displaced to the right hemisphere. Words compete with faces in the reader's brain. It's not a massive computation, but it is a sort of reorganization which takes place when children learn to read. Um, thanks to this understanding, we can also uh, explain puzzles of reading acquisition. And um, one puzzle which we have been able to explain from the brain's point of view is something you might have seen in your children, which is this notion of mirror reading and writing. Many children, when they sign their drawings, will write their names uh, in the improper direction, from right to left in this case. Um, here is another example of a child who has written Theodore Tivoglio Bene, okay? And the child is writing left to right, right to left, alternating in a writing system which is called Bustrofeden, which means how the ox plows. This was the way of writing in ancient Greece. But of course, children don't know about ancient Greece at that age. So how are they capable of doing these things? And many parents think, is this dyslexia? Well, we understand now what it is. It is not dyslexia. What it is, is a trace of this old function of the system which is trying to learn to read, we all have, all primates, have a symmetry mechanism which allows you to notice that these two faces are the same person, even though on your retina they are completely different pictures, but they are mirror images of each other. And this is an evolved system that we have to unlearn as we learn to read, because it is not useful and we have to distinguish these things as two different words or potential words. Uh, we have found indeed that the primary area which has the most sensitivity to this symmetry uh, is precisely the area that I've called the brain's letterbox, which is trying to learn to read. So essentially, it's not a wonder that children have difficulties with mirror reading and writing. Uh, this has nothing to do with dyslexia. It is a universal difficulty for all children that they have to overcome. And we might teach them explicitly by the gestures of writing to help them to overcome their difficulty. Another thing that we understand a little bit better now is this very classical question of phonics versus whole word training. Uh, you know there's been a lot of debate in psychology and in education. Should we teach the whole word level or should we really teach every uh, single letter and their pronunciation? Um, is there anything such as the global shape of the word which is being used in reading? Well, um, here there is something very important. As adults, we have forgotten how we were as children. We have forgotten how difficult it was to learn to read. And we think that we can just lay our eyes on a word and it immediately pops to mind. And uh, indeed, there is this notion of parallel reading. We read all of the letters at the same time. This gives us an illusion of whole word reading. But in fact, if we look at the brain, the brain still processes every single letter and does not look at the whole shape. So whole word reading is a myth, basically. All, what we have is letter processing, but letter processing in parallel across all, the, all of the letters of the word. The brain does not use the global work shape. Um, and in fact, in children, it's even worse. Children require more and more time for more and more letters. You can see this on this graph. This is the number of letters in a word, the reaction time of the children. And in first grade, they are very, very slow, and they need more and more time for each letter. So this is not at all whole word reading. It's slow, serial, one letter at a time. And as children progress, second grade, third grade, this goes away and gives this illusion of whole word reading. So I think we can be very clear on this point because there is a strong convergence with educational research uh, to suggest that the brain has nothing to do with this sort of exercises that my child had of picking up the ascender and descender letters and deciding that this corresponds to this word. The global shape is not used. Few words of conclusion, few slides of conclusion. I think neurosciences can help education. Uh, we understand now a lot about reading, and we understand that in all cultures, there is not so much variability. We always have the same brain mechanisms. Reading always requires specializing the visual system for the shape of letters and connecting them to speech sounds, even in Chinese, by the way. There are no letters, but they are characters, and some of them map statistically to the sound. Teaching letter to sound correspondences is therefore essential. It's one of the main pathways which is being transformed in the brain. Brain research converges with educational research. 
teaching of letter to sound correspondences is the fastest way to acquire reading and comprehension, not just, you know, uh, being able to decode the words. Um, how does this work? Because it works because there is a form of self-teaching. Once the correspondences are learned, um, children have this correspondence between letters and sounds, then they can recognize the words auditorily using their auditory lexicon, and then this more direct route between letters and meaning can be trained. It can be self-trained as the child reads by himself, even without a teacher. So uh, this notion of two routes of reading play a very essential role in all contemporary models of the reading process. Cognitive neuroscience can also lead to new software tools. And in very briefly, I want to mention that our colleagues from Finland have been developing over many years now uh, this grapho game, sophisticated software, which is just looks like a game to children, where you have to select letters based on the sound that you hear, and uh, many training games of this sort. And they have shown that just a few hours of training uh, with this little game suffices for preschool children to already begin to develop this visual word form system that I've been talking about. So um, with efficient tools that attract the child's attention and reward them for what they can do, uh, we get very quick changes in these plastic brains at this young age. Um, I want to mention that this notion of re neuronal recycling the idea that some areas are sufficiently plastic that we can shift their function slightly, which is what occurred during reading, uh, is a sort of general principle. We all are like this caricature of Darwin. We are humans, but we are also primates. And as primates, we inherit uh, constraints on our brain. Uh, our learning is constrained by the representations that we inherit from evolution, which concern not just language, but also number, space, time. And um, teachers must take into account this early child's knowledge, because if we understand what they have to displace in the child brain, we can teach better. Um, I want to mention that this is relevant to reading, but also, I think, very strongly to mathematics. We begin to understand that our brain, the human brain, just like uh, other uh, monkeys, is organized to understand concepts of the external world such, such as number. And the same brain areas that are concerned with number in the monkey and in the human brain. And on this basis, we can begin to understand what is the foundation of intuition of number sense that uh, develops later into a full system of arithmetic. And so on the very same principle of this notion that there are all brain systems that need to be recycled, we can propose an understanding, a beginning of an understanding of the development of arithmetic. And I want to mention that this is just uh, culminating now in my lab in the development of software tools that are based on cognitive principles and that can help children develop a better sense of number. And this number catcher software is just uh, available today. It's called the numbercatcher.com, and it's a new software that's freely available in order to help children develop their intuitions of number. Uh, finally, I want to finish by saying that you can read about these topics uh, in more detail. I realize that 20 minutes is not sufficient to convey all of these ideas, uh, but uh, primarily now I think we can have a short discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. So we, we can take uh, brief questions for a few minutes. Uh, if you would please stand up and uh, also mention who you are. Ah, yes, wait for the microphone, sorry. Could we have a microphone for this gentleman? Do you? No, no microphone? Okay, speak up. And I, I may repeat the question, maybe. Excellent question. Maybe I, I'll answer this one first. Uh, so the question was, can uh, adult people or even old people learn to read? Uh, the, the finding is that indeed the brain remains plastic, maybe not quite as plastic as in young children, but still plastic. And we have especially studied people who were illiterate and then learned to read when they were adults. We found the same brain changes by and large. There were a few brain changes that were missing, but most of them were present, including this circuit I showed you today. So people can learn when they're adults. They're probably just a little bit slower. So you're saying that we can learn even if you are 50 or 60, you can see that you are at four or five. 
I didn't say the same speed. But you can still do it. Yes. The second question, the interaction that you have with Oh, there is a microphone. The channeling of information from visual to analysis, etc. is it a chemical reaction? Or is it neurologic? Uh, what is it? Is it a chemical? No, it is a, a neurological transformation of information. Uh, we believe that each brain area is uh, computing, extracting some specific aspect of information. So first you start with essentially local features in the image, maybe a little stroke here and there. Then uh, the brain extracts the presence of letters combinations of letters, and finally it extracts the sound patterns in these other areas or the meaning patterns. And the connections essentially transmit this information from one stage to the next. Can medicine, can chemicals that we create accelerate this process or make it less? Can we learn faster with some medicine in the future? That is a wonderful and difficult question. At the moment, there is no uh, real proven smart drugs, but they are effects, for instance, of attention. Uh, I rather believe, especially in the context of this education conference, that we should modify the brain's inner chemical systems. And they are inner chemical systems that uh, help you focus your attention uh, and are sensitive also to reward. So when you give the child a reward, you are changing its brain chemical composition in a way which reinforces the behavior and makes the child happy, of course. Sleep is a very essential component of this learning algorithm. And I should mention that there are beautiful studies showing that giving children more sleep is one way to help them learn. So uh, in many cases, especially in cases of attention disorders, we can help children by giving them more sleep. Do we have time for perhaps another question, uh, madame? Uh, can we have the microphone? Oh, oh you I already have, have the okay. microphone. So then we'll, we'll take you a second. Okay. Yes, uh, my question is about dyslexia. Uh, I'm not dyslexic myself, but there are dyslexic people in my family. And having learned in the French system, I learned the letters cursive mm -hmm. in writing and uh, printed in reading, and I have, I'm a very bad speller. But I'm left-handed, mm. and I'm very visual, and now that I use a computer, I see my mistakes. Mm -hmm. When I type, I see them, because I, but they are printed. But when I curse, when I, <laughs> when I do cursives, I don't see them. Mm. So uh, I'm, maybe I'm just revealing something to you that will help you in your research, but did, did you, uh, research about um, dyslexia? Yes, uh, there is a lot of research about dyslexia. Um, and we understand now that it, it is, in, to some extent, we can see anomalies in the very circuits that I showed you today. Especially we think that the connection system of the brain may be abnormal in dyslexia. So maybe these connections are missing or in not sufficient number. We also know that uh, the setup of the brain quite early on, maybe even during a pregnancy, is not quite right in some of these areas. Not dramatical, so it can be compensated. And I, I would like to mention, since you mentioned cursive writing, yes. that this is something extremely important in teaching. There is very beautiful research contrasting children who have been taught with or without cursive writing. Cursive writing is good for the brain. It has another circuit which has to do with recognizing the gestures of writing, and it helps children learn to read. Uh, this is very well demonstrated now, perhaps because it helps break this symmetry that I was talking about, P's and Q's become very different when you write them. B we don't exactly know the they mechanism, but we know that backward. it is... Children still write backward when they do cursive. I mean, I've Yes, but it helps them to write in the proper direction. And uh, as in, for instance, the Montessori system, you can prepare children to learn to read. Preparation exercises include writing or just making drawings from left to right, if you are in a left to right writing system, um, making curves, and also training exercises for phonics, which are very well demonstrated. So preschool should also be preparing children for learning to read, and phonics exercises can help a lot. What about the left-handed, right-handed, uh, as opposed to using the mm. 
right side of your brain. Well, I think maybe we should give a chance to, uh, of mm -hmm. another person maybe to ask a question. Uh, uh, but did you have a question or someone here? Yes, you did. Well, there are many questions, so we have to decide. Maybe you have, where are we? Oh, uh, yes. I, I don't think um, you control anything about the questions. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I ask you about the, uh, um, do the environmental uh, factors and cultural factors affect the way that children learn language or uh, all, uh, all are the same, all children all over the world are the same to learn? Uh, that's a very nice question. Uh, we think that the brain mechanisms are very universal. Uh, children have the same basic layout of the brain circuits. But you mentioned culture and the environment, and this is an essential component. Uh, children, the predictors of uh, learning to read in young children are how well they are in phonics, this understanding of the sound systems of language, and also what is the size of their vocabulary, spoken vocabulary. If they know a large number of words, they will learn to read faster. So these, again, these are cultural factors that can be improved. And for instance, they are very simple things, but uh, uh, parents from low socioeconomic families sometimes need to be told that they need to speak to their children, that they must have this systematic interaction which will enrich their children's language system and prepare them for reading. So I think we can help reading way in advance, even if we keep reading at the age of six or seven, preparing children to learn to read at the age of three, four, five by enhancing their vocabulary and their sound system of language. Yes, thank you. Uh, now, um, can you bring the microphone? Thank you. We have a few more minutes, so maybe a short question. It's going to be a very short question. Hi, my name is Diana, and I'm working with a company that makes uh, online games to teach children Arabic. So my question is, are there any specific practices that we need to avoid in a game so that we do not divert the brain from developing the right areas for le uh, reading? Ah, a very good point. Um, I, you point to the fact that we need to have children concentrate. And I think actually games are very good for that. Even children who are said to have attention disorders, when they are gaming, they tend to be very concentrated. Uh, but it is very important that we have them concentrate on the right level of representation. And I have been arguing that the level of the letters and how they correspond to sounds is an essential level. Um, uh, I am worried indeed that part of the uh, problem with the whole word reading approach is that children are not attending to the appropriate level of letters, but they're trying to treat the whole word as if it was a face, uh, something that you could recognize globally like this. Um, so I think it is important to have children concentrate on the letter level first, and then they can concentrate on the message letter. Um, I also think that it's important to avoid too much distraction so in the software, but as well in the manuals. When you have reading manuals that are full of pictures, uh, thousands of items on the page, this creates trouble, especially for children with attention deficits. So uh, maybe we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Denise Conway from CETA. Over here. Where are you? Oh, okay. um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the role of parents or some literate person who uh, reads to the child little uh, story books before they have um, an interest actually in, in the words per se, but focusing on pictures and, mm -hmm. and then creating a, a love of or an interest in learning and then a motivation to understand that there are letters and words that actually apply to some meaning in, in the actual storybook. Mm -hmm. And my second question is around, is there an age that is actually too early in which uh, to try and get your child to learn uh, to read? Mm -hmm. So for motivation, we know it's a important multiplier of learning in the brain. You can think of the brain as having learning rules, but the intensity of learning will be multiplied by factors such as attention, concentration, motivation, and reward. 
Um, so I would, I would think that yes, uh, we already know that the brain's learning algorithm is very sensitive to uh, the, the level of concentration of the child. Um, now, for your uh, second question, this is something that I've researched a little bit and I've not found much evidence to suggest that there is a critical age for learning to read. As I was answering earlier, even adults can learn to read and uh, they do so with the same brain systems. They might be a little bit slower, we don't really know, um, because the learning experience, of course, is completely different when you're an adult, so it's very difficult to compare quantitatively. In the other direction, should children learn to read at the age of five or four? There are some examples of this happening spontaneously in many families, and as far as we can see, it's not damaging, and it's again teaching the same circuits. Um, so I think the answer from science is just we don't know. You know, sometimes scientists have to be very modest and just say we don't know. Um, I, I really think that uh, from what we know, it, there may be no damage at all being done by learning to read earlier. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very sensitive to the idea that young children must be in these very creative years, active, um, you know, moving, uh, creating, playing with mathematical uh, objects or games. So there's a lot more than reading, and maybe reading can wait until the age of six or seven. In the previous uh, session, it was mentioned that Switzerland tends to teach its children to read later, and as far as we can see, it's just as fine, right? There are many, many questions. We have one minute left, so I think we have time for one question. Uh, whoever has the microphone or is close to it, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, can you stand up and say who you are? Yeah. Hi, my name is Zera. I'm from Pakistan. I just want to know that there is a debate on language and education, especially for the children who are from grade one to grade three, that we suggest that the mother tongue should be the language of instructions with the other languages. Mm. Do you have any, uh, can you su suggest us what, wh how many languages a child can learn till grade, like year eight or 10? Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say that the speed of learning um, is uh, not something so easy to determine because it varies depending on the language. And there, there, there is beautiful research showing that Italian, for instance, can be learned in three months because it's a completely regular system. Every letter corresponds to a sound. English is probably the world's worst alphabetic language, I'm sorry to say, that's the one we choose, um, because there are many irregularities, and it is known that children will need two more years to achieve the same level as in Italian or in other regular languages. So, but typically, even in English, after three years of training, in grade three, uh, children should be readers. And there is no reason for a pedagogy not to achieve success in reading in one year for regular languages. Uh, I was in Brazil recently, and they say that they wanted to have training to read in three years. And I kept telling them, no, in your language it should be three months, or maybe six months, or one year, but not more. Um, at that age, you can learn to read in other languages, which was your original question. Languages will combine into the same areas, and we don't exactly know what's happening in bilinguals for the moment, but we see no cost. There seem to be rather savings. When you've already learned one language, you can read a second one faster. Thank you very much for your questions and your attention. <laughs>